Hello. Hello, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, Good afternoon, sir. Uh, yet another week has come to us. We thank God for that. Uh, from the obstetric side, I'm doing science, I'm starting with signs and symptoms of pregnancy. When somebody is pregnant, actually last week we were looking at changes when somebody becomes pregnant. So we are looking at signs and symptoms of pregnancy. So when a woman becomes pregnant, the condition is revealed by certain signs and symptoms. Some of these are caused only by pregnancy and are known as positive signs of pregnancy. Uh, there are certain signs and symptoms that the pregnant woman will show. Uh, it will look like uh, the person is pregnant, but he may not. And they, we call them presumptive signs. And there are some which are a bit closer to somebody having pregnancy. We call them prob probable signs. And we have certain signs which are positive. When you see them on a woman, you know the woman is pregnant. These are the presumptive signs. The menorrhea, lack of menstruation, change of environment or once the woman is sick, you can have this problem. So it's a presumptive sign. So when somebody is not menstruating, we can't jump into conclusion to say that a person is pregnant. Morning sickness usually associated with vomiting in the morning, or nausea in the morning. When somebody has this problem, she, she, may, she may be a pregnant woman. Then breast changes, uh, that also show that the woman is pregnant. In the sense that when a woman is uh, even menstruating, you know, about to menstruate, the breast becomes heavy. Bladder irritation, when you have infection of the bladder, you can have problem of frequency of urination. Skin changes, the body, when the skin changes, uh, in the pregnancy, Calidania nigra, uh, Oculasma, and all this. It can also not necessarily mean that the woman is pregnant. Abdominal enlargement, maybe fibroid or any tumor can cause abdominal enlargement. So it's not a positive sign. And the quickening. I have all these things, uh, as we said, uh, Immunorrhea may be a change of environment, malaria, gastric paranephritis, infective hepatitis can also cause morning sickness, breast change in the multigravida, the primary areola may be pigmented with previous uh, pregnancy. So you can see the woman is pregnant. Tingling sensation may also cause in a non pregnant state. Bladder irritation, as we said, diabetes, can, it may be due to nerve disturbance, diabetes, frequency of urination. You can see the woman is pregnant. Skin changes, for instance, when the woman has colostomy, which we saw as one of the changes in pregnancy, it doesn't necessarily mean that a person is pregnant. Abdominal enlargement, cyst and fibroid, can, tumors, can, anxieties can cause that. Quickening is the response or the kick, the kick in, the movement. The woman will be feeling that the baby is moving. They, they are not liable sign because the woman can be stickly. A normal movement of the bowels to be a quickening. A really anxious woman to become pregnant. Uh, may have that problem. But the problems, pro, probable sign, you have changes in uterus. When the uterus is becoming big, uh, on the seventh week, the uterus look like a hand, uh, tenth week, you see changes coming up, you know. 
Uh, you see that the woman's abdomen is big. Uh, it's very likely, very close, about 80 to 90 percent that the woman is pregnant. But sometimes it can be fibroid. You know, and then we are in their sign. This also shows positive. Six to 12 week of pregnancy. Uh, it is done by establishment gestation. And two fingers are inserted. When he gets signed, what is the sign? What is the sign? Six and 12 fingers, you insert two fingers and put your hand on the uh, uh, abdomen, abdomen, the, the vagina, the anterior furnace. When you raise the furnace, uh, your hands will meet, will meet. You know, the fingers of both hands almost meet because of the softness of ethmos. Don't forget, ethmos is, is the junction between the cervix and the cavity of the uterus, the body of the uterus. So when you insert your hands into the vagina and you go to the last point, upper part vagina, where the funnel sex are, and you raise your fingers, and another hand is on the abdomen, you see that they all meet, meaning that the cervix is very soft, vagina to be very soft. It, it, it may indicate uh, some pregnancy and the acne sign, it which on the color of the vagina changes. You know, the, it, it is violet blue, it's discoloration of vagina due to the increase in blood supply. When you put speculum and then you raise the walls of the vagina, you see that the walls change in color. But this can be seen when the woman has tumors. So it's not very positive. We we'll see under sign it weeks on. It is the increased pulsation. Because there is increased blood flow to the vagina, there will be increased pulsation. The left vagina due to increased blood supply to the cervix. This is very, very unreliable because it can be felt in pelvic tumors and cellulitis of the due to congestion. Then we have softening of cervix. If you hit the cervix, especially the external osteo, and you hit your finger, in a non-pregnant woman, it's very hard. It's very hard. And then uh, the cervix is as soft as the lips, while that of the non-pregnant uterus like the tip of the nose. So, once the, the, the cervix is soft, soft, we may, we, we may move a little bit, about 80% to suggest that the woman is pregnant. Ballotment and bouncing means that when you put your hand on one side of the abdomen and then you hit the opposite side, you see the baby will move. If the baby is there, the baby will move. In the, so tapping a structure which lies in the fluid such as the fetus in the amniotic sac and in such a way that a rebound you see that you move and hit the other side of your hand indicating that the woman is pregnant. Uh, uterine shovel is the, it is the soft blowing and sound head on auscultation. And this sound, when you are auscultating the abdomen, is synchronous with that of the mother's pulse. The uterus shovel is also heard when fibroid. What they are saying is that when you take fetus stethoscope and put on the abdomen of the woman, the, the sound, there will be some sound, blowing sound, and it should be in the same, it, it, it's a, it's a in line with that of the mother. But this can also happen when the woman has fibroid. So it is not uh, very loud. It's said to be due to blood position from the narrow to the wider channels, especially the placenta side. It can be heard from second to third week before the fetal heart sound. Then brassy contractions. 
They are painless contractions of the uterus from about 16 weeks. If the woman is pregnant, from 16 weeks, she starts complaining of contraction, pain. By these uh, contraction, by these contractions are not so strong to actually create some pain. To occur 15 to 30 minutes interval, the contraction is in circulation of blood to the placenta side. With each contraction, the alternated blood is brought out from the uterine sinuses into the veins. What we are now seeing are the positive sign, positive sign of pregnancy. If these are there, if you are able to elicit this information from the woman, then it indicates that the woman is pregnant. Fetal heart sound, fetal parts, fetal movement, ultrasound scan, and pregnancy contest. Don't forget, we use gonadotrophin hormone, which is produced by trophoblastic cells to test pregnancy contest. Pregnancy contest, so if they, they, they test for, they ask you to bring, bring your any morning during, and they test and they have that hormone there, then it's positive that you are, the woman is pregnant. So as I explained, can be had through the abdominal from 20 weeks, was thin. it can be had earlier, the whole. The fetal heart rate is twice the mother's pulse. So it's between 120 to 140 beats per minute. That is the normal range. The, the normal range. So that is, then you have fetal movement from 22nd onwards of the pregnancy. You feel like the woman, when you palpate, see the fetal part of movement, inspection. Then when you look at the woman's abdomen, you see that something like woman being moving. Then we have the fetal parts. Uh, the fetal part, the fetal part can be felt well as pregnancy advances, so that by 28 weeks, the nurse can distinguish the different parts of the fetus, the head, the back, and the legs. So when you are feeling this, it clearly shows that the woman is pregnant. So that is positive signs of pregnancy. You so that the woman is pregnant. When you do a scan and you see some some subjects on the scan, it shows that the woman is pregnant. The painless test that uses sound waves to create image of the organ and, and structures inside the body. So that is the fetal parts that can also indicate that the woman is pregnant. And then you have a um, prognosis contest, as I said. It is a test used to detect human chorionic gonadotrophin in the urine and serum of a woman. Remember, we're doing pregnancy. We talk about this, it's produced by trophoblastic cell. When fertilization takes place, you get xylitol, you get morula, you get blastocysts, and then you get trophoblast. So trophoblastic cells produce it when they are inside the cavity of the uterus. So how do we diagnose pregnancy? Our biological test of pregnancy is based on the fact that but 10 and 14 days after fertilizing, the trophoblastic layer of the embedded ovum secret chorionic gonadotrophin, which is excreted in the urine of the pregnant woman. If some of the urine is injected into one of the various tissue, tissues of the animal, it takes place in the sex organs. What I'm trying to say is that, or what the lecture is trying to say is that, so for plastic layer of the embryo, you know, produce a hormone they call chorionic gonadotrophin, 
and this can be de detected in the urine if the woman is pregnant. So immediately they detect this in the urine, it means the woman is straight away pregnant. Then, so the, they, they said the first specimen of the day is the best. The first specimen of the day is the best. Now, after detecting that the woman is pregnant, this woman brings a lot of complaints. Most pregnant women going to antenatal clinic bring a lot of complaints. Those yes. complaints that they, those complaints that they bring, we call them minor disorders. Most of the complaints, they call it minor disorders. Minor disorder. Now, when you hear minor disorders of pregnancy, and then the general advice, what we mean is that you know those disorders that the woman will complain of. They are minor because they are brought about because of the pregnancy and they can go, you know. So they are conditions that arise because of pregnancy. They are considered as minor disorder because they are mainly the result of physiological changes occurring in the body. Immediately the woman delivers, those complaints will go away. So that is the minor disorders. The first one is morning sickness. Remember, it's not so uh, uh, comfortable for a woman to get up every morning and feel like vomiting. So we say the man with this order, but it is not life threatening. It can be cured or it is through advice when the woman delivers, it vanishes. Constipation, this is common due to action of congestion. Remember, we we're talking about changes. We mentioned progesterone affecting smooth muscles. That's the fourth function of progesterone. It dilates the rectum, and the woman will not be able to pass through and become very worried. It's not, it, it can easily go. Especially, you advise the woman to take a lot of fruit, vegetables, and fruits. Lessative like milk or magnesia be given, that should be done in a hospital. Then advise the woman against giving herself enema, as this may cause abortion or premature labor. Some women are so frustrated that uh, it's, it, they, 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 they are. So you advise the woman against they also encourage exercise. Women pregnant can exercise. What we talk of women exercising, pregnant women exercising, is continuing doing your health chores, can walk, you know. But if if you are pregnant and you decide to to, to be lazy, it has, it has to be to say that, you know, it won't help you. When you get constipated, it's not easy unless you exercise. Women complain of backache, bad posture, very big abdomen, so the, the, the woman have some bending, and sometimes because of constipation and hemorrhoids, complain of back pain. It may also be due to weight of the gravid uterus and sacral nerves, including the hormones and pelvic joint. Most women do complain of heart burns. Remember, these are all minor disorders. The burning sensation in the mediastinum due to the effect of hydrochloric acid. Remember, when we're doing changes, we said that hydrochloric acid defeat power or the cause of relaxation or cardiac splinter. You know, it just hit the chest and the woman will complain of heart burns. Patient should be reassured and advised to sit up for some time after meals and sleep with extra pillows, sets of milk, water, you want to give some relief. 
and passes like magnesium, silicate or milk of magnesia can help the woman in this case. The pregnant woman should be advised to eat a little food at frequent interval to avoid overdistension. In nutrition, when your, your stomach becomes overdistended, it causes release of hydrochloric acid. So with a pregnant woman, she can eat but small at frequent intervals. By the patient wear loose dresses and flat heels shoes. You know, she should also wear supporting bindings. When the lost abdomen is present, she should have a lot of rest to avoid constipation. It occurs in varicose veins. Most women present varicose veins. Varicose veins normally appear on the legs, and about ten percent of pregnant women the sluggish movement of. It's also because of the progesterone effects, which cause dilatation of the. Uh, uh, dilatation of the blood vessels and the legs. So you, you, the woman will not feel comfortable, especially when it appears on the labia minora. You know, it becomes very dangerous and the woman has to deliver in a hospital. Very good being associated with dull, aching pain. They usually disappear after delivery just to recur in subsequent pregnancies and even the worst. So the woman should avoid long standing tight bands, beach around the waist. She should raise the foot when sitting and put them on a the pillow when lying. The last stocking of great bandage may be worn. For varicose veins of the vulva, apply the firm perineal pad to avoid friction. If there is friction, what will happen is that the blood vessels will rupture. Strongly advise the woman on hospital delivery because of possibility of bleeding. If the woman has varicose veins on the vulva, the woman will bleed. When, when the baby is coming and is causing friction on the blood vessels, it will rupture and the woman will bleed. So hemorrhage too is one of the uh, dilatation of veins still because of progesterone effect. But this side it occurs at the rect rectal side of the, of the woman, the rectum. And it's, it's very painful. And it occurs when the woman strain on, 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 on stool, like the constipation. When the woman has that problem, then it, it is, is uh, when the woman has constipation, uh, hemorrhage, it's related to or it's associated with constipation. So when hemorrhage collapses, you ask the woman to use silk baths, the common salt, magnesium sulfate, crystals, or cool compresses must apply. Defend the woman to the hospital where the doctor may order some suppository. Some women to have fainting attacks. Remember, for those who have just joined, we are looking at minor disorders. The common complaints the pregnant woman will normally come to antenatal, and then it occurs when there is sudden change of position or posture, and also long standing in the sun or crowded atmosphere. It, it also occurs as a result of anemia, fainting attacks and cardiac impairment. If the patient is not a cardiac patient, there is no need to worry on the fainting attack of pregnant women. But if the woman has a heart problem, then of course we should be concerned. How do you prevent that? Women should avoid heavy meals, rest at least two to three hours during the day. If the fainting is due to standing, she should lie down with the hand glue check on the hemoglobin as well as blood pressure. There will be skin changes, social and minor disorder, itching of the skin, and abdomen. Natural causes are unknown, 
but it is thought to be due to the stretching and also the hormone uh, in circulation. Avoid detaining the woman for far too long, period on the couch. Um, there will be itching of vulva. It may be due to result of poor hygiene, vagina distract, diabetes or crash. Find the cause and treat. If the woman comes to the clinic and she is she is scratching on the vulva area, find out the cause and then treat. For instance, if it is due to poor hygiene, advise the woman to wash her vulva with soap and water, clean and dry it. Itching, it, itching may also be vaginitis and, and candida arbica. So, so exclude any condition like scabies and advise the woman to apply either some oil preparation or calamine lotion. If it is due to allergic reaction or skin condition, refer the woman to the hospital. Edema is also one of the common physiological changes that takes place due to the pressure of the gravity trust on the veins. It is physiological. There would be no if it, if it is physiological, in other words, the woman has no protein in the urine, blood pressure is not high, then we say it's, it's, a, it's a, a, what do you call it, minor disorder. The woman should be advised to avoid long standing and to rest with the feet on the stool at least during the last trimester. But if the edema is accompanied by other protein in urine, or high blood pressure or both, then of course it's a sign of preeclampsia. What they are saying is that if you have edema and that edema you have is accompanied with protein in the urine and blood pressure, then we call it preeclampsia. That edema is not a manner disorder. Another manner disorder is breathing difficult when the abdomen when the baby is big and the uterus has come to the abdomen, inside the abdomen, uh, abdomen. It pushes the organs and they push the diaphragm and cause problem with breathing. So it's a minor disorder. Women, most pregnant women also have problem with their gums and their, their gums and their tongue, you know, Common and more, very common in pregnant women, especially those who can eat balanced diet. They occur as a result of inadequate vitamin C intake, vitamin B group, and vitamin C, calcium intake, as well as poor oral hygiene. So, patients find it difficult to eat when the, the mouth becomes sore, they become malnourished, as well as underfed, and anemia may ensure. I agree that anxieties can be cured by routine administration of B complex vitamin. That is why when pregnant women go to the hospital, whether they like it or not, they give them fesulates, folic acid, and vitamin B complex to cater for all these problems that the woman will be having during pregnancy. And you also be encouraged to take a lot of fruits and vegetables. Gengivitis is also relieved by improvement of oral hygiene. When a woman is pregnant, she has to very, very important to pay attention to her oral hygiene. Frequency of nutrition is another manner of disorder. When a woman is pregnant, she gets up and be eating frequently. So 12 weeks before the uterus rises out of she urinate. And then when she's going to deliver, when she's going, the patient sleep is disturbed when that problem comes. When she's going to deliver to you. When she's going to deliver, the patient sleep and should be encouraged to sleep in the afternoon. That's how we solve it. Then we have insomnia, cannot sleep well. Okay, but it's more usual late pregnancy. You need warm bath lasting at night. A drink of warm beverage, sleep in a cold, dry place will help. 
If it doesn't help, you consult the doctor. So we have cramps, pains in the calf muscles, pains in the calf muscles during pregnancy. That's also very disturbing. So all these things we listed and then just explained are called minor disorders. Any question, any concern so that you can explain. If no question, let's go ahead. We now enter antenatal care. What is the use of antenatal care? It's a period of submission given to by a midwife or a nurse to a pregnant woman. It covers a wide range of areas when the woman went at antenatal clinic. It's a submission, submission given by the midwife next to the pregnant woman. Two, to encourage the, sorry, aim of the antenatal or prenatal care is to encourage and maintain good fiscal, mental, spiritual, as well as social well-being of the mother. When the woman becomes pregnant, she has a physical problem, she has a mental problem, that's a spiritual problem. Some even end up, when they deliver to become mentally great. It's also meant to detect early, meant to detect early and treat any complication, be it medical, surgical, or surgical. A woman pregnant can have medical problem. A woman pregnant can have surgical problem. So, and that can only be detected when she attends antenatal clinic. And then to ensure that she returns to a good state of health, the uh, health after delivery. Antenatal clinic is also to ensure that the mother goes through, let's say, labor successful. In the antenatal clinic, they educate the mothers what to do when they go to deliver. They educate the mothers what to do after delivery. Then it also, there they talk about breastfeeding of the baby. Talk about breastfeeding, and so they prepare the woman for breastfeeding. So the um, antenatal clinics can be done anywhere. It can be done at home, maternity home, hospital, chip compounds, health centers. You can do antenatal clinic anywhere. The only thing is that for good antenatal clinic, the clinic must not be too far away from the patient's home. Number of visits to clinic. Mothers should be advised to attend the clinic when they are pregnant, as soon as possible. When a woman detects immediately, if, he, uh, if it is one week or two weeks or something, she should go to antenatal clinic. The 20th and 30th weeks are period of possible onset of preeclampsia. So pregnant mothers should attend clinics every four weeks, every four weeks, once every four weeks, until 20th weeks. Now, they should be seen every two weeks until 30th week, and then from then every week, so until the time of delivery. So the, during the visit, anemia is corrected, if present before the onset of labor. All multi-gravity with pre previous bad of certification treatment can have their parents assess the appropriate mode of delivery arranged before onset of labor. So a lot, a lot of work is done at antenatal clinic for pregnant women. It is very important that when a woman is pregnant, she's advised to go to uh, what do we call it, antenatal clinic. Patients are strongly advised to report to the hospital immediately, even before the next person should anything abnormal occurs. If they ask me to come man time and you will go home and there's problem, you go back. The reason is that this will help to save her, her life or the life of the baby. 
when you are running antinatal clinic, how do you show that this antinatal is a, the, your 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 activity are effective? One is meant to reduce maternal morbidity and mortality. Two, when you are able to reduce neonatal mortality. Three, when you prevent prematurity by knowing all about that. In antenatal clinic, they educate mothers on good nutrition. So if prevent abnormal and difficult labor, they educate mothers about labor, as you said previously, to avoid substance using a certain technique and to eliminate fear and anxiety. It's not so easy when women become pregnant, especially pre-migravid women, you know, Come pregnant, they have anxiety and fear. What is the pregnancy going to do to me? When I go to labor, how is it going to happen? All these anxieties are cleared at antenatal clinic. To detect abnormality like pelvic disproportion hemorrhages on time. So that is the antenatal clinic. All right, so there are some patients in the hospital when they come to antenatal clinic. We book them. When we say you are booked, what it means is that you are advised not to deliver anywhere apart from uh, a, a hospital because of the nature of your pregnancy or the patient of the patient pregnancy. All premature gravid women, women having pregnant for the first time, are booked to deliver in a hospital. Any patient, any pregnant whose height is 1.5 meters, very short, and wear small size of shoes, most of these patients may have problem with pelvis, so they are booked to deliver in a hospital. Patient with a history of stillbirth. Some of you have delivered children and they have all died. No, you need that death. Some of you have delivered and have postpartum hemorrhage before. Some of you have had previous cesarean session and forced delivery. They are bookable patients. They book them to come and deliver in the hospital. Patient with blood pressure over 130, 80, the third person, she is what? Well, booked. Don't forget. When you are pregnant, you don't have to have high blood pressure because of progesterone effects. No. multi para woman over 35 years, woman who is over 35 years of age and grand multi para is booked. Those with resource incompatibility are booked. Early premier gravity, almost elderly premier gravity women are booked. Women with Diseases like TB, heart, chronic nephritis are booked. Patients with surgical complications, operation at the lower limbs can affect the head, so they are booked. So that is the bookable patient. This patient we just mentioned are not allowed to deliver in the maternity room where there is no hospital theater. Now, how do you care for the patient? Now, as nurses, we talk a lot about pregnancy and so on. We look at the patient from the social point of view, psychological point of view, educational point of view, medical, physical, mental, and obstetric care. For, for the, when they come with the approach history, patient first visit, we look for general particulars. Medical and family history, past obstetrical history, gynecological history, present obstetrical history, accurate history taking name and address, age, religion, number of years married. If the couple has been married for 10 to 15 years and this is the first pregnancy, then it is an indication that they suffer some problem of fertility. The employment of the husband is very important herself to, to determine if she can sufficiently feed the baby. We, look, we take that information. For medical history, 
Enquiries should be based on the hearts. You know, don't forget that when the woman is becoming pregnant, 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 there's slight problem with the heart. And there's possibility of gestational diabetes. So we ask whether she, she, uh, she's a diabetic, TB, epileptics. So that is the medical area. Neurosy, that is the lungs problem, rheumatic fever. I said the heart, ask, especially if there is any history of past illness. The midwife must ask whether the woman has malaria, hookworm. So these are all the medical area we look for. Investigation of syphilis, gonorrhea, and HIV. Don't forget these days, anywhere you go, to, you are pregnant, you deliver, you test for HIV. Blood transfusion. You also find out whether the blood test has been given before. The blood should be regrouped. Most of, when you go to antenatal, they make sure that as part of the care, they get your group, blood group, so that it's in, if anything happens, then they will get transfusion. Family history, twins in your family, the family has to be, nervous instability, diabetes, malaritis, potential hypertension, epilepsy. For gynecological history, look whether you have had an operation we call malinectomy, which is operation to remove the uh, uh, fibroids, the vagina plastic operation, shoidica. If you have tobacco incompetence, the tie of cervix, you have had that before. In which case, you might have to deliver in a hospital. If they have to do shoidica for you, you have to deliver in a hospital. Pass of surgical history, it's important to know the history of every previous pregnancy and period. With the previous pregnancy, the date and duration of each pregnancy, whether it was terminated in abortion, we want to know uh, whether it was carried to full time, we want to know that's your previous pregnancy. Any complications such as swollen ankles, headaches, high blood pressure, or any bleeding leading to antenatal hemorrhage. These questions were asked. Then the postpartum in your previous pregnancy, you know, labor, did they deliver you by instrument or severe cells? So your mode of delivery will be request. I mean, they will ask you length of time of delivery, any complication or postpartum hemorrhage. If, if there is, take note of it. As of in the perineal tear, perineal in the region between the vagina and anus, that area, is there any tear? As of in the perineal tear, and whether it was sutured, and also in the history of between placenta. After delivery, the woman will go for about six weeks. That period we call a period. So how long the woman stayed in bed after delivery? whether she was able to breastfeed a child that should be found out. History of the found out whether previous babies were born alive or dead. Found out from the woman, the sex, and bear the any abnormalities. Found out also whether the baby is still alive and the number of abortions she has had in it. And ask her whether she knew the cause of the cause or otherwise investigate to find out to see the subsequent pregnancies. You ask for mode of feeding, you know, is it the previous pregnancy, the breastfeeding, or it's a bit artificial feeding, so that you know how to advise her. Then you come to her present pregnancy, the midwife or static nurse should direct her attention to the patient's health and well be find out a menstrual period and ask how long she bled for that period and calculate the expected time of pregnancy delivery. Almost all women, before you leave the antenatal care, they will be able to tell you when you, are, when you are likely to deliver. We call it expected date of delivery or expected time of delivery. So you ask uh, the last menstrual period, 
and this is the calculation. We call it UDD, expected date of delivery. So if she gives you a date, the last menstrual period, if she gives you a last menstrual period, then add, add seven days to the first day of the last menstrual period. First day of the last menstrual period. Sorry. Then you count nine months forward or three months backwards. And then count a year as the duration of the normal period is estimated to be 280 days or 40 weeks or not calendar months. Then you add a year. 10 lunar months, which is the time of embedding the oven until the onset of the And this is how we work it out. This human last menstrual period is 12th of June. 12th of June, the last menstrual, the last period of the last menstrual period. 6, 2019, you add 7 to 12, and that will be 19. Then this is plus seven, then you subtract, you go back. You know, when you subtract three from six, you get three. And then you add one year. So the woman is expected to deliver on the 19th of March 2020. The last menstrual period is 12 of the February month. June 2019, when you ask someone, you subtract three and you add one year, she will deliver in 19 March 2020. So, last menstrual period for this another woman is 2nd January, 2nd January 2023. This one, it is easier to ask someone and go forward now. And then, because you are same same year, it means the, this woman is expected to deliver on the 9th of uh, 10, which is October 2023. So that's how we calculate it. Either you go forward backwards, or you move, uh, you go backwards, or you move forward with uh, uh, backwards thread, or you move forward now. We call it yeeted. Expected date of delivery, or as some books will tell you, expected time of delivery. So, you have the symptoms which may be present. There's any morning sickness, and then frequency of nutrition change in breasts. She herself will tell you irritability, vital movement, regular bowel action, vaginal discharge. And then you have uh, note. If the vagina decides to believe in the amount and color should be noted, should be noted. Enquiry if there is any pain, general inquiry should be made as to the person, any symptoms, and any matters which, gives, which should be given in detail, such as the members of. In antenatal care, there are some uh, patients we call high risk patients. I restriction. Find out if the pregnant woman is multiparal. You know, it's a bookable patient. Those who have had four children and above, or those who are over 35 years of age with their part in surgical history, like bleeding before, you know, and obstetrical complications and part medical history or high-risk patient. Please, you look out for them. We call them high-risk patient. High-risk patient. Drugs taken must also be known. If the woman who has come to you at antenatal care, you ask whether she has. If she has some drugs she's taken, and if she has, what will be the effect of the drug on the fetus? Since drugs taken six weeks before pregnancy, we lead to abnormality during the development of the fetus. So you ask and advise appropriately. Nutrition, you also educate them on nutrition. You know, the, the dietitian, if possible, come in 
There's none. The nurse will inquire about the type of milk because the nutrition is necessary for growth of the fetus, fetal heart health, including good health and baby postnatal, good maternal health to withstand. Therefore, the diet of pregnant women should provide the following nutrients for growing of the fetus, maintenance of mental health, physical strength and vitality for the mother during labor, and successful lactation. The diet of pregnant women should provide adequate carbohydrates, fats, protein, minerals, and vitamins. And so these are protein, fats, protein, build tissue, fetal brain, placenta, uterus, breast, blood volume. And these are the sources of the protein. Fish, egg, meat, beans, acushi, and then Fat and oil will provide the woman with vitamin A and D and energy. Uh, and these are the sources, butter, margarine, all types of oils. Carbohydrates will provide energy, and these are carbohydrate foods, rice, maize, cassava. So you are putting the correct balanced diet. All these things should be the diet of the mother who is pregnant. It's important for the midwife to know that there is a tendency of expected mother in Ghana to excessively consume energy-rich foods, carbohydrate foods, and this will completely dispose her to what we call obesity, overweight. Overweight and pregnancy does not work together at all. You know, they should be guided against a diet with adequate proteins, essential minerals, vitamins found in fruits and vegetables will help to reduce healthy mother. It's important to educate mothers on proper nutrition based on available local food items and their economic strength. Factors influencing individual or group nutritional status should be noted. When you are handling individual, you should know whether the person will be able to buy the, what you are talking about. If not, then you have to do a change. Food consumption pattern of the mother should be noted and proper education given. You know, the, 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 the example, cultural belief includes religion against the consumption of foods like eggs, snails, you know, other foods. So we need to do nursing process here. The first part, we assess the patient and know how to advise on nutrition. Minerals you are very important. Iron, you know, is very good for blood. For the mother, it's good for hemoglobin. Uh, means the fetus stores iron in the liver in the last the, the daily requirement is 15 milligrams. Source of iron, liver, liver leafy vegetables, yeah. kidney, and eggs. We have done nutrition before, so this is not new. Calcium is very important for bones and formation of fetal bones and teeth. Uh, please, the one, who's, the one who's talking should give, should lower his voice. Yeah. So we have calcium, salt, milk, milk product, vitamin C, bones, fish eating with bones, vitamin B complex is very important. Yeah, yeah. Absorption of the nutrients which may influence by persistent nausea and vomit. So, Ahmed, Ahmed, please, you are disturbing us, okay? Ahmed, please, you are disturbing us, you are disturbing us, please. You are disturbing. And Linda, and Linda as well. Linda, why? Please give us the opportunity to talk. So we have the vitamin B complex. That's also very important. Vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin K. Obtained from fresh fruits. Vitamin D bones, vitamin K. Obtained from egg yolk are also very important for the pregnant woman. Then we examine the pregnant woman after this advice. The pregnant woman might be examined by the doctor and the nurse or midwife. Each of them can examine on their own. And then to gain more knowledge about the patient, a friendly atmosphere is maintained. 
Don't forget, we are still in antenatal clinic. These are the activities. Yes, attendance for examination of the pregnant woman during the first visit is done properly. Yes. Please, sir, sir, yeah. please, you can mute us all on your yeah. on your side. Just mute us so that yeah. the noise can disturb us. <laughs> Yo. uh, please, 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 if you have something making noise, it disturb all of us, including your lecturer. You should. So the aesthetic nurse should be able to detect any deformity after. We are, the woman is still at antenatal, so we have to examine her. First attendant, you have to do thorough examination so that if there is any problem, you can detect. Take the height and weight as the patient is taking first. They say short women have, have small pelvis. The tall women have adequate pelvis. Any woman 1.5 meters tall, we have a contracted pelvis, so we have to take the height, and then these are all suspicions. So it, in most cases, in order to detect the patient on my height, she should be weighed on the first visit and subsequent ones. This done to detect edema and excess body fluid. You do the blood test for all the hemoglobin, wasserman or can reaction tests, grouping and cross-matching then you do resource incompatibility test. Blood cell count should also be done if megaloblastic anemia is suspected. Then urine is collected for this test. Specific gravity, color, dema, other sorry, culture and sensitivity test, sugar, albumin, acetone. Then blood pressure is taken. Yeah, it, it, it is the blood pressure. It is the blood pressure within the arteries and measured in millimeters of mercury. Diastolic and systolic are both estimated. The pressure taken, don't forget that blood pressure taken at antenatal clinic is very, very important. Every time the woman comes, they take the blood pressure. The rise in blood pressure will indicate uh, pregnancy induced heart hypertension during the second half of the pregnancy. The average should be 120-70. After 20 weeks, it becomes low. And if it rises above 130-90, then it should be investigated. Sometimes the woman will have to be admitted. These are the advice we give to the pregnant woman before she leaves. You advise her on, you, have, uh, you ask her to ask questions. Uh, if not, you advise her Fresh air, sunshine, exercise, education, travel, rest, clothing, employment, travel, care of the teeth. Uh, fresh air, adequate supply of fresh air and sunshine is healthy for the mother. You know, so the, the mother has to wear uniform that to bring in fresh air. Clothes, clothes should be not have braziers, no consumer clothing. Pregnant, you are wearing trousers, you know, how to wear what we call maternity dress, shoes should be comfortable, very flat shoes because of the posture. Then employment, we ask to not get tight so much. You are working in industry where you have a lot of smoke. We advise the mother, strenuous fiscal activity. So we 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 we, we advise the woman not to to involve in this. The phytotoxic environment can be cut glass, particle gases, and there's no anesthesia, all these things. Uh, you advise the woman, medical and obstetrical complications, you advise the woman, employment regulation, you advise the woman. This, those in the sedentary employment need to walk around to do some exercise, come to the house, Still maintain your house chores so that you become active. The pregnant woman, after the childbirth, there should be support systems such as daycare centers, which can help the mother to decide when to return to work. The bowels which move every day, leather tips, good habit of defecation after breakfast, will encourage 
plenty of raw food intake, adequate food intake, not enema. Care of the teeth, oral hygiene should be promoted, dental decay should be referred to appropriate quarters. It is no longer believed that the fetus extract calcium from the mother's teeth, but rather from the mother's bones. So, but some mothers, when they don't eat well, sometimes they lose their teeth and they have associated it with pregnancy. So the mother should be encouraged to take foods rich in calcium. The skin should be kept active. Remember, one of the problems on blade is itching of the skin. So the skin should be kept active. Daily bath is necessary. Some women will be concerned whether when they are pregnant, they can still have sexual intercourse. There is no contraindication on that. When the woman is pregnant, she can still have sex. So, but coitus should be prevented in any pregnancy of women who will be predisposed to abortion. If the history tells her that this woman has had abortions, then she has to be very careful at the early pregnancy to avoid sexual intercourse. So otherwise, there's no contraindication in sex when the woman is, it is even healthy for the woman to have a husband and to have a sexual intercourse that will produce a very, very healthy baby. Medication to the greater danger of causing developmental defects in the fetus from grass, exit during fertilization throughout the first trimester, the period of organ, organ, organogenesis. When the structures are forming, organs are forming, the woman resort to taking drugs without consultation, proper consultation, she can get abnormal child. Self-treatment must be discouraged. Nurses and midwives will discourage self-medication, including yourself, especially my sisters, including you yourself when you are pregnant and you think you are a nurse, please avoid self-medication. Go to the hospital. Alcoholism is, is, is contraindicated. You can take alcohol, and but excess might be avoided. Otherwise, you get a child called fetal alcoholic syndrome baby. The baby will be born, as well to smoke also will environment, even if the mother does not smoke. You have to be very careful when a woman is pregnant because when the smoke enters the woman, it reduces the oxygen to the baby. The smoke is carbon monoxide, so it will poison the blood and it goes to the baby. And when you take a lot of alcohol, you produce a baby, which we call fetal alcohol syndrome. So we examine the woman before she leave the hospital. Loving the woman before she leave the hospital. Any question on that? Any question? On that? Otherwise, I'm moving to anatomy for the day. So in the anatomy this afternoon, I'm doing lycoamna. Lycoamna. The lyco that is surrounding the baby. Any question on the obstetric that we just saw? 
in the question, please. What is left for you is to sit down and read. You what whatever you get the information, we read because we'll ask you questions during your examination. Don't forget that you have entered the what we call mid semester exams. We will ask you Hello, questions sir. to cover some, some of this. Hello, sir. Yeah? Yes. Sir, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Sir, please, we, sir, sir, please we need your slides. I don't give slides, please. Then go and read. I Sir, please, slides. the handouts you are not in. Yeah, you have to ask your prefect wherever you are to, to call me, then I'll know the way I'll send it to you. Some okay. people have already bought, I've sent it to them. Okay, yeah, so thank you. It's not, it's not a big deal. Yeah, but we are not forcing you. If you think you can get information somewhere, no problem. What I have. You have to study and pass your exams. That's very important. You know, the lycoamnine is a pain fluid which fills the amniotic cavity. The cavity, the baby is surrounded with two membranes, what we call amnion and chorion. The lycoamnine is the fluid that is surrounding the baby. When the baby is going to be born, that fluid comes first. You know. Sometimes to the fluid, immediately the memory structure, then the baby is born, the fluid comes. You know, but let's see, it's not very, it increased the pregnancy. It increased the pregnancy advances. Thousand or 10, but at the end of the day, we get 800 remaining because the fetus swallowing it. The fetus in that fluid swallowing it. So at the end of the day, we get um, the specific gravity is 0.07 to 12 in the early pregnancy because it is more concentrated in a smaller amount. It's made up of 98.8% water and 1.2% solids. It contains albumin, urea, uric acid, creatinine, Elasticity spring myelin and blue ruby. That lycoamine you see when the baby is going to be born. That is the composition. What is the source? It comes from, from so many sources, but technically, biologically, its origin is not known. But the amnion surrounding it are cells, and these cells, these cells produce fluid into the cavity of the animal. You know, and it is, you can also get it from the maternal blood. The mother also provides fluid into it. And it's believed that it's made up of maternal and fetal blood vessels. So that is the, the supposed sources. But the main origin is not known. Believed to be nutrition of fetus. The baby as the baby is growing, it urinates. And this urination to increase the volume of the lycoamnine. In the some maternal disease like diabetes, eclampsia, fetal malformation, monsters, when you ovular twins, more fluid is added. So more fluid is added. What is the function of this fluid? It protects the fetus from injury. If you hit the abdomen of a pregnant woman, the liquid will absorb it. The blow, the liquid will absorb the, 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 the pressure. It allows the fetus to move freely. It prevents adhesion. If the baby, the water is not there, the membranes will get adhered, it will get on the baby. And <clears throat> so it prevents that, that problem occurring. The membranes get adhered to the baby's body. So water has prevented that contact. You know, so it keeps the fetus in an environment of constant temperature. The temperature in the lacoamnine is different from that of outside. So immediately the baby is born, it cries because you have changed the temperature of the baby. It provides nutrition, nutritive material to the fetus, such as glucose and sodium chloride. It equalizes the pressure on the fetus in the uterus, and it forms the fold of where 
and help in dilatation of cervix. You know, we have internal and external cervix. The internal cervix, uh, uh, internal and external os. The internal os, the water is on it. So it during labor, it easily causes it to open. So that is the it prevents the full force of uterine contraction during labor on the baby, the water, the water surrounding the baby. When the uterus is contraction, the full force of the contraction is reduced by this liquid. It prevents excessive reduction in size of the placenta side during labor. It washes the vagina canal, birth canal. You know, the birth canal is covered during changes it blocked by opaculum. And when the mother is going to deliver, it comes out as show. And what happens is that it washes that opaculum and creates a very sterile felt for the baby to be born. It protects the fetus from infection so long as it remains intact. No microorganism can leave the baby with the liquid there. There will be abnormality, quantity and color. Quantity and color. Sometimes you have plenty of fluid, plenty of excessive amount of lycor. It occurs in association of fetal abnormalities. Excessive amount of lycor, polyhydrominos, polyhydrominos, especially when the mother has diabetes or young twins. Then we have another period that some women to also come with small liquid surrounding the baby. We call it oligohydrominos. Oligohydrominos. It is when there is little lycoaminide. You know, they are all not very good. It may lead to malformation due to the fact that there is no space for the fetus to move and develop. Color too can change. It may be greenish showing that there is presence of meconium. When the woman delivers, is about to deliver, and then lacto amina comes and is green, that is not the color. So it means there's meconium in it. It means something has happened to the baby. It will also donate fetal distress and or a brief presentation that will make the what the meconium in the when the baby becomes, I mean, stressful. I mean, it, it, it's it's attend. It 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 it, it attend uh, what the nature is called into the the the, 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 the lipo and then change the color to green. It may be yellowish during if the baby is joined it, especially in resource incompatibility. The fetus may be born alive with with severe jaundice and sometimes may die. It may also be found in cases of untreated syphilis, and color may become permanent. What they are saying, all this thing is that the the color of the color of um, what do you call lacquer ammonite is not greenish. It is not yellowish. When you read, uh, those of you who have my my information with you, when you read, you realize that the color is not. And when you go and read somewhere, to the same thing. But when you say color is colored greenish. Tapid, yellowish, then it means something has happened to the baby. Then you made your investigation. Now, we come to female breast. Breast is very, very important in aesthetics because at the end of the day, the baby, the baby is going to feed on breast. So we need to know the breast. And the, there are, these are accessory organs. They are organs which help female reproduction. The shape is hemispherical with a tail in, in the axis known as tail spin. Let me go back. That is the shape, you know, that is the tail. And then you have the, that is the nipple. Around this is the areola, you know, and these are the, the shape of the breast. Now, when you go here, you see certain things like that. This, we call them lobes. That's one lobe, another lobe, second lobe. These are the areas which produce milk. 
These are the aliens which produce milk. And then when they produce milk, the milk is put into a tubes and the tubes are carried to the nipple area. This, these are the tubes. And they're stored here at the ampullar region. And when the baby is born, the baby mouth has to be fixed here and then inject into the mouth of the baby. You know, these are fats. This space is interlobular space. Remember, the size of the breast does not determine how well the, 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 the production of milk. The production of milk depends on the lobes, these lobes. The more you have them, the more you produce milk. You can have them with small breasts and you can have them with big breasts. The size of the breast is determined by the fat. If the breast has plenty of fat, then the breast becomes very big. So let's look at them. They are situated on the superficial fascia of anterior chest wall. It extends horizontally from the second to sixth rib. They are separated by the chest wall by loose areola tissues. Each breast is attached mainly in the pectoralis major muscle, and they are held stable in the suspensive ligament. So this is just an anatomy. The size differs according to individual, and at different stage of development as well as age, the size differs. You can expect the same mothers to have the same breasts. They are small in size in childhood and large at puberty, increase gradually during adolescence, and become larger in pregnancy and period. Then you see it withering out when the woman is growing old. A big breast is only due to fat, and the fat and the breast tissues are the same. So all the breasts have the same tissue, the same lobes. You know, so you have the nipples, you know, the, over the center of the breast, you have a prominent area, six millimeter, 1.2 lamb, and top being flattened. That the nipple, it is highly sensitive. Nipples are highly sensitive. It is sensitive because when the baby touches the nipple, the, 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 the mother should feel that the baby is on her breast, covered with skin. Yeah, but when you go inside the, the breast, it has lobes. I've shown you lobes. I've shown you these are the lobes. This ones are the lobes. You know, it has lobes. And how many lobes? Every woman is supposed to have 15 or 16 or 17 or 18 or 20 lobes. <laughs> Open this. <laughs> Sorry. And these lobes have the tubes. They have tubes. They have tubes which goes into the into the nipples. Then just around the, the, the nipple, you have brown area. Remember in changes in pregnancy, that becomes black. You know, so about two, we call it areola, 2.5 centimeters in diameter, six millimeters thickness. Yeah. The areola is continuous with the skin. On the areola, areola area, where you have the color change behind the nipple, under that, you know, that areola, we have 16 to 20 openings of sebaceous glands, you know. On the, the areola, when you look carefully, you see some holes. You know, so those glands, they are called Montgomery's tubercles. Montgomery's tubercles. They can clearly be seen during pregnancy. You can see them during pregnancy. They become very prominent on the breast. And they produce, they produce sebum you know, to keep that areola wet, otherwise it will crack. Then when you go inside, you have either 15, 16, 17, 18, or 20 lobes. And each lobe is a breast on its own. Each lobe produces milk for the baby. And in between the lobes, you have fat. Is the fat that determines the size of the breast. Those who have small fat in the breast, 
their breasts were very small. Women with plenty of fat between the lungs, their breasts is very, very big. But the production of milk is dependent on the number of loaves you have. If you have 16 and another woman has 20, obviously that woman will produce more milk than the 16. The gland radiates from the nipple to the periphery. The loaves are held together by loose fibers and connective tissues with a good deal of fat. Each loaf is complete unit and has no communication with a load lying below it. Each loaf is a press on its own. Then we have the loaves arranged in like, if you want to see the way the loaves are arranged in the breast, then get an orange and peel it with your hand. You know, peel it, you know, you see the way those things are arranged there. It's just like breast loaves. And they look like pyramids in shape, the loaves, with their apexes direct towards the nipple. Each lobe is divided into lobos again. Each lobe is divided into lobos. And the lobos are made up of millions of milk secretions that we call alveola. So alveola is sitting on the lobos. And they produce milk. And then the milk will come through the, the, the tubes of the lobos into the main duct of the lobe, which we call lactiferous duct. The cells of our produce cholesterol during pregnancy up to the third day and throughout lactation period. There are small duct which drain into each lobe. And the duct join with, with, uh, with other smaller duct from each lobe to finally form a larger duct known as lactiferous duct. It runs, it runs to the middle of the lobe towards the nipple and under the areola. Beneath the areola, the ducts dilate to form the ampulla, to form the ampulla or lactiferous sinus, which act as reservoir. The lactiferous duct narrows the veins and continue to the nipple and the city duct. They can be seen as small orifices on the nipple. When a woman with the nipple, you look, you see some holes. So that's, those holes are coming from ampulla. The duct, small, small duct, and that's where the milk passes. They are lined with cuboid and epithelial cells and surrounded by connective tissue. They are enclosed in small muscles. The viola, the viola which is sitting on the lobes, which produce the milk. Remember, if I ask you, which part of the breast produces the milk is alveolar cells. But which part of the breast is milk stored is ampulla. Which main tube in the breast bring the milk to ampulla is lactiferous ducts. So take note of all these things. Between the small lactiferous ducts and alveolar cells are spinal shaped cells called basket cells or myoepithelial cells. Running close to the wall of alveola, alveolus are capillaries. There are a lot of capillaries. They carry blood, which has substances needed for manufacturing of milk. That's why during pregnancy, you see the woman with plenty of breast, with blood vessel running on her breast. So blood supply, which is breast is little supply with, with blood, with, uh, with blood to blood vessels. You read on blood supply, internal mammary arteries and venous drainage, the lymphatic arteries and the nerve supply. Let's go to the function of the breast. I'm telling you to read blood supply for arteries and venous drainage and nerve supply. The main function of the breast is to produce milk to feed the baby. That is the main function. What it means is that breast has other functions. That one, you all know, they have secondary functions. But the main function of the breast is to what? Is to breastfeed, to use to feed the baby. And the mother's lactate, what influence lactation? And when we say lactation, is production of milk. 
when we say lactate like production of how do they produce milk? This production of is dependent on adjustment of hormones only, but also upon good supply of blood to the breast and adequate circulation throughout the breast. Because there should be blood flow, so that blood will bring nutrients to the, to the breast to manufacture the milk. So good supply of blood is very, very important. And hormones do also, so we shall see the hormones. After delivery, immediately placenta is out, expulsion of placenta. The level of estrogen and progesterone, remember we're doing the change. More estrogen is produced for uterus and for the breast. More progesterone is to produce so that it will sustain the pregnancy. Immediately it is, uh, the baby is born, placenta is out, estrogen, during one the estrogen that prevent the anterior loop of the pituitary from secreting prolactin. So immediately it is born, baby is born, prolactin that after being prolactin is stimulated, and it, uh, it, it goes to the alveolar and stimulates the alveolar cells of the breast to produce milk. It is about 10 days after delivery that the actual breast milk flows from the breast. Take note of this. Most mothers, when they deliver, first three days is difficult for mother to produce milk. However, it does not also mean that when the mother is having problem in producing milk, you should go and buy lactogen for the mother. You have worsened the lactation process. When the mother is not delivered, putting the baby on the breast and the baby cycling with force also initiate the flow of prolactin and oxytocin so that it will help the breast to prolactin is milk producing hormone and oxytocin contract the muscles of the breast to inject milk into the mouth of the baby. So therefore, the avola and make up of specialized cells which have the ability of selecting food substances from the capillary surrounding them to manufacture milk. Milk is therefore made in lobes. We have big lobes, and then we have small, small lobes. Small, small lobes, that is where the milk is, that is where we have alveolar cells. The milk then flows from the lobes through the small lactiferous duct into the large lactiferous duct into the center of the lobe. The milk is then stored in the ampulla. And when the baby fixes on the breast, in a, listen to this, when the baby fixes, when the baby mouth is on the breast, on the areola of the breast, and then pulling the breast, it presses the ampulla with its gums, which expel the milk through the excretory duct into the mouth, in addition to its circling action. So the breastfeeding during that period is very, very important, whether there's milk or there's no milk. So when there is milk, it's, the milk will just, we will draw from the ampulla into, into the mouth of the baby. And when the ampulla becomes empty, the more milk will flow into the ampulla again. If the suckling is not there, the breast becomes congested with milk, and the mother will get what we call uh, engorgement of breast, and that is better. No, lactation does not depend on hormonal adjustment only, but also upon good blood supply to the breast and accurate circulation throughout the breast. So that is what the lactation is all about. Fetus is in the uterus. So the fetus has its own circulation. The fetus has its own circulation. So we are, we are going to see circulation of the fetus circulation. The circulatory system of the mother is different from that of the fetus. The fetus develops its own blood. At no time do the fetal and maternal blood mix. The fetus does not use lungs and elementary tracts, but depends on each mother for oxygen and nourishment. 
and therefore has temporal structures to aid in circulation before birth. I'm repeating the third point. The fetus does not use lungs and elementary tracts, but depends on its mother for oxygen and nourishment, and therefore has temporal structures. Those of you who have my lecture, please underline that. That's very, very important. To aid in circulation before birth. What is it? These are the temporal structures. They are four in number. We call it ductus venosus, foramen ovale, ductus atrosus, hypogastric atrosus. These are temporal structures found in the baby's circulatory system. Don't forget, it is very, very important. The circulatory system of the fetus is different from that of the, the, the mother. Now, what are the doctor's venosus? These blood vessels from the umbilical vein, when the blood is collected from the um, you know, umbilicals we saw as arteries and veins. So from umbilical vein, it carries the oxidated blood. Before it reached the inferior vena cava, it carried blood that had been oxygenated and replenished by the placenta to the heart for circulation throughout the fetus life. So the so this uh, ductus venous is from vein to vein. When it, the blood is coming from the placenta, it branch to the to the to the uh, for coming from the branch to the feet, uh, what the livers and then shunt itself create another blood vessel we join the vena cava you know vena cava carries deoxygenated blood but this blood coming from the heart from the placenta carries oxygenated blood so it joins the vena cava and that branch is what we call ductus venosus. Ductus venosus. Then, when the blood, the, the when the blood circulates to the heart, normally in a normal heart, the, the oxygenated blood has to go to the ventricle, orbital, go to ventricle, and then go to the heart, uh, the, the lung for oxygenation. But when the blood reaches the right side of the heart, which is the oracle, <laughs> there, is a, there is a connection between the two oracles. There is connection between who is talking, please give me the opportunity to talk to my students. I be beyond the Barbara. You are making the opportunity to talk to my students. Another Barbara, so off your mic. So we, we, we have we, we have temporal opening between two oracles. That temporal opening, the oxygenated blood, instead of going down to the ventricle when it comes to the right side of the heart, moves to the left side of the heart, oxygenated blood. And it moves through a hole we call foramen of heart. So that is the second structure, which is artificial there. Then when the oxygenated blood enter the iota, you know, from the pulmonary artery to the descending iota of the heart, of the iota, and carries the impure blood return from the head. And so what we are saying is that when the oscillated blood go to the left side, and they go to the ventricle, then it comes through the pulmonary artery, and the blood is shunned into the brains so that and it sent through another artificial blood vessel there we call it doctor's atrocity doctor's atrocities remember we have it in our lecture notes if we have it you all this is have been explained then you move from there from the doctor's atrocities the blood will circulate into the brain collect the carbon monoxide and enter the left side of the heart go to the ventricle, when you go to the, then move to the aortic arc, and then move down to the, to the, to, to the, what do we call it, to the blood vessels, going to the limbs, lower limbs, 
collecting oxygen, uh, uh, the structures of collecting oxygen, and you have more carbon dioxide being added. Then before it gets to the lens, there is another branch of blood vessels. There are two. There are two. That's why we have two arteries in the Amalaka cord. We call the ductus arteriosus. They carry the oxygenated blood into the placenta, and then the placenta will replenish the oxygen again. So we have ductus venosus, ductus arteriosus, foramen ovale, and hypogastric arteries for temporal structures. So that's the hypogastric two vessel branch off from the internal iliac arteries and are known as ambalaka arteries. When they enter the ambalaka or it goes to the placenta, they return impure blood to the placenta for oxygenation and replace, replace it for replenishment. Blood which has circulated throughout the fetal needs to be oxygenated and replenished. So it is carried by two umbilical arteries to the placenta, where an interchange of what gases take place between the fetal and maternal blood by the process of osmosis and diffusion. So we have four layers of that separate fetus from maternal blood. I said that the maternal circulation and fetal circulation does not meet. So these are the structures that separate them: syncytial trophoblast, cytotrophoblast, mesoderm, and capillary walls. We are in the embryo that separates the maternal blood flow to the and that of the fetal blood flow. Carbon dioxide and alpha excretory product are given off into the maternal blood, while the nutritional substance is picked by the fetal blood. No. The replenished blood returns to the fetus by the veins in the amylar carpal, which goes directly to the liver. But before reaching the liver, the large uh, branch known as ductus you know, that's what we have there, and giving off the empty and purified blood. Then we have the pheromone of valley, I've already explained all. You no, know. So if changes that okay, changes that okay. These four structures are what we call temporal structures. When the infant cries, when the baby is born, and you cut the umbilical carco, and the infant cries, the lungs expand. The, the, the vascular flow is increased. The blood flows into the lungs, passes through ductus atrocious into the iota, now flows throughout the pulmonary system. Immediately the baby cry, the lung system comes into power. The four structures die off, and this is what happens. The ductus atrocious ceases to function within five minutes after birth. Within two months, it closes. The valve, the valve, valve like foramen of honey in the heart between two oracles also closes because of the force of blood coming from the lungs. It also closes. Now, so <clears throat> the circulation within the umbilical ceases when the cord is cut and the arteries to deliver fibrosis to form ligamental tears. The ductus venosus is also fibrosis. When the cord is climbed, the blood is not flowing again through the hypogastric artery. So they also get uh, what we get, fibrosis and become supporting ligament. But this is what happens. If the, the, this temporary structure, especially the foramen ovale and then ductus arteriosus, refuse or it's not able to close, you get a patent foramen ovale and patent ductus arteriosus. And sometimes there will be hemorrhage. You know, what we talk called patent foramen ovale is the hole in heart. If a foreman of value refuse to close, doctors are going to refuse to close, the baby will get hole in her. In other words, they have to operate the baby and close that hole. Otherwise, the baby will not survive. The same thing, patent doctors are atrocious. Then you have the, the foreman of value does not close completely. There is then a mixture of artery blood and venous blood 
when now the baby has been born and the baby will show continuous sinuses and fatigue and need to be closed. The death accident rate does not fibrose and blood continues to pass along it from the preliminary artery to the aortic arch or either causing the blood to mix together. And that also will create sinuses. Hemorrhage may also occur when the cord shrinks after delivery. The linkages may slip off or become loose, permitting the blood to flow through the umbilical artery. This is dangerous and it can cause the death of the baby. What they are saying is that any time the baby is delivered and the linkages are used to tie the baby, the, the cord, you have to make sure that you inspect the cord every now and then. Otherwise, and when the cord is shrinking, it can leave the ligature when it doesn't disconnect itself from the baby and the blood can flow through that and the baby will bleed and die. So that is the, the uh, anatomy there. That's the end of the lecture for today. I'm adding assignment to your drawings. You are going to draw fetal circulation. You are going to draw um, uh, fetal circulation and uh, what we just did, um, what we call it, fetal circulation. Okay, draw the fetal circulation and add, and let me have the, I'm, I'm trying to see how we can, you can bring your assignment to me. Maybe next week, I'll try to find out the possibility of you sending your assignment. Every class prefect or area prefect, they will bring all the assignment to you. You bind it together and put an envelope and hear message to me. This is very, very important. You have to do the assignment. You have to bring it to me because it will help you. That's how we are going to do it. You add uh, what uh, this and uh, theta circulation to it. Thank you very much. Any question? Huh. Sir. Sir. I'm listening. Please, about assignment, I want to suggest that can you make the submission for us when we are coming for the end of semester exams? Master, you see, you can suggest them for a lecture. Okay. Master, you see, what you have to do is to make effort to get you to, I thought you are going to suggest that to come to me early. Don't forget, I'm seeing the number to get into 300. And immediately you finish the exam, they require the max for them to, 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 to publish the results. So I thought you are going to suggest how we can do so that it reaches me, so that I'm mad for you. End of semester, this is my master. And they give me this in end of semester and they'll be requesting for results by the close of December. It's not fair. The marking will not even be the objective. So please, next week we'll settle on how to get the papers to me. That's why I said nobody should draw to make a diagram on a, a sketch pad. It's too big. Paper, you can roll it, put it in an envelope, then the whole center will just EMS, how much does it cost? And you address to Dr. Shaban, it will come to me. How much does it cost? And I'll mark. Then by the close one well, during your exam, those who are coming there to examine you, I'll give it so that you see your marks. And then you know whether you are doing well or you are failing. Hello, and sir. Any other, any other concern? Sir. Before I leave you, yes? Please, uh, with what my brother was saying, you see, uh, some people are living in their very remote areas to get the assignment and then um, bring all to you on time is going to be a very big issue. That is why he was suggesting that maybe we can do that on the exam day or the, as my sister is saying, on the day we're going to do the practical, we can uh, submit them on that day. 
Ma and Master, do you, do you know what? Do you know what? We are we are all in Ghana. I'm a Ghanaian. Those who come and see Ashanti region and all those kind of things. What is the remote remoteness of this that the person can reach you? I don't understand. <laughs> Master, I'm there teaching you, and you are supposed to do your assignment. And because the assignment here is very, very important. The students have to do assignment before you can do them. And I'm talking from experience. You know, I'm uh, last year we're so happy that we have to do assignment for something. You know, and I'm telling you, you you can you can do a degree program in in comfort like that. That's how I see you people. It is once you have committed yourself to study, even if you are sitting in the in the Ashanti area, you are in a rural area, and your your prefect is in Kumasi. Why don't you come and give your assignment to your prefect? It just one day travel to give your prefect that forget to compile it and then send it to the lecturer. And I say you are in a rural area. You don't do things like that. All right. So you, I, I'll give you the time to present your assignment. If you don't bring it, I don't have problem about that. If that is that is you because you have decided not to bring it to do your course and you not do assignment. So that's that. There's nothing difficult about this thing because we are you are not in you are not outside. You are not outside Ghana. Ghana. Even even when you are doing the, when you are doing the, the, the outside Ghana program, outside. you can do assignment for them. Okay, bye bye. Anybody who wants anybody who wants from my information from my 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 you my, can see my, your my, you can see your, your center prefect and center call me call me for for, for, for it. it. For, for for it. Ask me how they can get. It. Ask me how they can get. It. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Hello, sir.